So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's forum is on education policy, governance, and funding, a topic which is very, very vast, and I don't know how we're going to cover it in uh, within an hour. Uh, but we will have uh, perspectives from India and Australia, and we will be happy to have perspectives coming in through the chat box uh, from other parts and other regions of the world as well. This is a fourth forum as part of the Australia-India Education Research Forums. And what we are trying to do is to create these online forums and create platforms to bring in researchers together and have these very healthy uh, discussions on comparative higher education. Uh, in today's webinar, uh, we have researchers and very eminent scholars from both India and Australia, and they will be uh, speaking on uh, national policies, funding, governance, etc., of higher education institutions. I will introduce the speakers one by one before we start uh, asking them to speak. Uh, let me introduce uh, from uh, the Indian side, Professor Sauman Chattopadhyay, who is a professor at the prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru University's Zakir Hussain Center for Educational Studies. Uh, his research spans the economics of education with a strong focus on higher education policy, public finance, especially in tax evasion and the black economy. Uh, he has produced numerous influential publications, including a recent book that he wrote on changing higher education in India. Then we have Dr. Garima Malik again from India, who's an assistant professor at the Center for Policy Research in Higher Education at the National Institute of Education Planning and Administration in New Delhi. She holds a PhD in economics from Ohio State University and specializes in governance and management of higher education. We have our friends from Australia. Christopher uh, Zigurus is a professor based at the Melbourne University Center for Study of Higher Education. His work primarily focuses on internationalization of higher education. That's a topic very close to my heart as well, Chris. And in particular, the development of policy and regulatory frameworks for cross-border educational flows. Then we have Wilm uh, Croucher, who is an associate professor again at the University of Melbourne's Center for Study of Higher Education. He was a former Fulbright scholar and his research focuses on the political economy of higher education with extensive publications and leadership in major research projects. He is a regular media commentator on Australian higher education and has appeared as an expert witness to several parliamentary inquiries. So we have this very august uh, panel, of both from India and Australia, and I am going to come straight uh, to my question. Professor Sauman, first to you. Uh, so let's uh, begin with taking a stock of the present infrastructure of regulation and governance that characterizes the higher education landscape in our country. Uh, can you give us a brief overview of the key systems and policies that define uh, Indian higher education as well as Australian higher education, if you've studied that? So uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, begin. Uh, it's a very complex uh, regulatory system that we have in India, and we are making a transition to the new system as envisaged in the National Education Policy 2020. We have right at the moment, uh, University Grants Commission at the top as an overarching body to regulate general education in the colleges and universities, combining the role of regulation and funding together. Then we have the professional bodies, law, medicine, and engineering education, separate bodies. And for quality assurance, we have NAC, a separate body altogether. Now, when you are making a transition to the uh, national education policy uh, framework, uh, let me uh, spend uh, a, a few seconds on this. We, have, we will be now having four pillars for regulation, for funding, for quality assurance, and for uh, the credit transfer and regulation of the professional standard setting bodies. Right, And all these four pillars will be supporting an overarching uh, authority, the Higher Education Commission of India. Now, if we want to understand how the higher education system is being regulated, I'll be just briefly mentioning about some of the key regulatory dimension. The first uh, UGC, the first regulation is the regulation of the teacher, particularly the recruitment of the teacher, and as well as the 
regulation monitoring of the career advancement scheme or the promotion of the existing faculty. And that is based on a, a uniform template making a distinction between humanities, social sciences, and natural, natural sciences to an extent possible based on the score, the faculty score by teaching and research and outreach activity. Now, so there is a possibility of straight jacketing here. And that is important because, uh, you know, it, it curtails abuse. It uh, ensures uniformity across the university system, but it has got some pitfalls because it does not give much discretion or freedom to the university to regulate the teacher's appointment and their promotion. The second is a very important dimension of UGC regulation is called the graded autonomy. See, the universities, the higher education institutions have been classified into three distinct categories based on their performances measured in terms of the quality assurance score, that is the NAC score or the world university ranking position. Now, the basic rationale behind this graded autonomy is that those universities which have done well in terms of the, the score uh, in terms of the NAC score or the World University Ranking, uh, THE and QS uh, in particular, they will be given the autonomy. And the second and the third category institutions, they will be subject to more regulation. Now, what do I mean by autonomy here is very important. Autonomy is being bestowed on two fronts, particularly academic and financial. When it comes to the academic autonomy, the this category one institutions can offer new courses, can have research parks incubation and foster university society linkage. We'll have some uh, freedom to hire faculty from foreign universities as long as they're from the top 500 universities, foreign student recruitment, incentivized pay structure. This category one institutions can also enter into a collaboration with the foreign universities, right? So there are different dimension of this autonomy being given, but here, one very crucial thing is that this academic autonomy is being blended with the financial autonomy. That means they can offer new courses as long as these universities do not claim any additional fund from the funding authority, that is the UGC. The third uh, UGC regulation, which is very important for us because that gives a signal that how we want to be a, a part of the global arena is the uh, regulation regarding the institutions of eminence or world-class university. So 10 public and 10 private have been accorded the status of IOE or the world-class university and they are being, being provided, particularly the public funded universities are being provided with additional funds and freedom to feature in the top 100 in the next 10 years in the world ranking. Then we have got the regulation to uh, for the PhD program in terms of the supervision, in terms of the, uh, the examination of the thesis. Basically the idea is to achieve uh, some uniformity, standardize the procedure, because the lack of compliance is a major issue for the government of India. And then uh, one or two other program, one is that uh, recently UGC has come out with how to foster foreign collaboration and twining program, joint degree program, and the dual degree program. Now, when we are making, uh, I'm sorry, just uh, uh, 20 seconds, when you are making a transition from the existing system to the NEP, Two major things have been uh, are being implemented now. One is the widening the basket of courses that the students can choose from academic bank of credit and the governing structure. This governing structure will be more or less streamlined in a particular line. That means the universities will be setting up what we call board of governors. So that will be marking a major departure from the existing system to the new system. Thank you very much. Let me stop here. I'm sorry, Professor Chattopadhyay, because I can uh, yeah. imagine uh, there's so much to share. Uh, Indian higher education is really going through a wonderful transformation and transition. Uh, we all experience this as academics, and uh, especially what he spoke on the Category 1 universities really gives a lot of autonomy, which generally Indian universities did not enjoy till now. And of course, the shift to the new education policy that I'm sure Garima will cover a little later. But Chris, coming to you, I'm could you share with us some key policies from the Australian higher education system? Sure. Thanks, Vidya. And look, I have to apologize. Just as Salman was speaking, a big machine started up outside my office. I don't know what this is. Uh, if there's some background noise, I apologize for that. Um, 
Yeah, look, so Australian institutions, by comparison, have a higher degree of autonomy, I think you could say, than, than institutions in India. And so some probably something like where the direction that uh, India is headed in, I guess, for those top institutions. Um, and so that's the case for universities in Australia, which are overseen each by its own university council. The leadership of the university have a fair degree of latitude to make decisions internally for universities in particular. So for, there's other institutions, non-university higher education providers, which are kept on a tight leash by the regulator and don't have that degree of autonomy. Um, uh, so th that autonomy, I think you have to say, is within very dense regulatory frameworks within Australia. Uh, we're a highly regulated society generally. Um, and, uh, and so there are all sorts of constraints on what university leadership in practice can do. So for example, on staffing, uh, Australian universities are free to hire, you know, make decisions about hiring, you know, uh, you know Salman said, um, you know, in India, those universities can hire foreign staff, but they have to be from the top 500 universities. There's not that degree of kind of micromanagement of hiring decisions in Australian universities. So they could hire who they like. It's up to the, the universities to choose the people they want. Um, and uh, so the number of staff and the level and the area of expertise and so on, it's fairly uh, free there. But there is a sort of national regulatory regulation of employment law um, with Fair Work Australia as the lead body. And some universities have got in trouble for breaching uh, employment laws in relation to casual staff in the last few years. So that's one example of the, where the, the constraints do actually uh, sort of, uh, come into play in a, in a very public way. Um, so within institutions, though, administrative burden has become a big issue. And one of our colleagues, Peter Waller, has been doing some research on the way that that affects academics, uh, the kind of the internal regulation as much as outside regulation of, of academic life has is taking up a lot of time now. And I think that's felt by academics across the system. Um, so in terms of regulatory agencies, we have TEXA, uh, the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Authority, which uh, sets minimum standards for all institutions uh, and periodic audits of processes and so on. Um, and then the, the Commonwealth is using funding uh, agreements with individual institutions to try to steer behaviour or steer the direction of delivery of programs and so on. But look, I think one of the big structural issues in Australia uh, in terms of funding is the distinction between publicly and privately funded elements. So with publicly funded students, which is, you know, undergraduate domestic students, um, who, you know, students pay some of the cost and the government pays some of the cost, but the allocation of those places is determined by government. So it's kind of, that's steered by government through periodic agreements with institutions. The government has an influence on what sort of disciplines are taught, which campuses and so on, a bit of influence there. Um, and that uh, sort of achieves a kind of level base of funding per student across the system. But then we have a, a private uh, system alongside that with privately funded students, so international students and domestic postgraduate fee paying students. Um, and that's really an open market. Um, institutions can set their own fees as well as many international and fee paying students as they like. Um, and uh, the, the regulation there is really consumer protection legislation, more or less, to try to protect those students um, and so on. Um, and so a big issue in Australia now is that the, the public funding for all universities by the state is uh, not sufficient, really. I think everybody would agree for the... the you know, to achieve quality across the whole system. And so the government relies on institutions achieving private funding through private students, but the, the distribution of private income is very uneven. Uh, and so we have some institutions with very high degree, high amounts of income from fee paying students and some with very low. And that's, that's become a, a, uh, an issue of uh, concern, which I think Will will go into a bit of detail about that later. But I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, again, sorry for stopping you. But uh, as an Indian academic uh, and who has been on the University Grants Commission for almost two terms, I'm glad to hear that you spoke about uh, a high amount of regulation in Australia. Because sitting in India, we always believe that we are overregulated and 
other countries have the uh, more than enough autonomy. But I'm glad you brought in the student, ex uh, you know, the, the governance part uh, when you look at funding, which comes from the public funding that comes from Australian uh, native students versus, you know, the funding that comes from international students. And I you can imagine why Australian universities are so aggressively poaching inter international students from all across the world, which I think Indian universities need to learn from. And there's a lot of learning from Australian higher education governance in, in that context. So I'll come to uh, Professor Garima. Uh, you know, we've all been discussing about the national education policy. And many times I've given more than 100 webinars on this. And, you know, uh, many times I say that it's more discussed uh, in international forums than in India. Uh, but there are some nuances. Uh, there are a lot of good things of the national education policy. Uh, and there is, of course, an impact on the overarching regulatory framework, or the, I would say the governance framework. Uh, if you could throw some light on the governance framework, and I would also insist that, you know, if you could throw some light on the implications that will have on the university leadership, because it's quite a huge change, you know, a whole shift of, uh, and there needs to be a mind sh mindset shift of leaders, uh, even teachers, you know, when it comes to implementation of the uh, of the national education policy. So, Garima, if you can, uh, you know, um, help us in understanding this more and help the international audience also understand this. Thank you, Dr. Vidya. Uh, so basically, uh, the NEP 2020 talks a lot about effective governance and leadership. And uh, though uh, Professor Soman Chattopadhyay has already uh, put some light on that. I will talk more about the governance and leadership at the institutional level. So uh, uh, he has given the systemic uh, broader overview. But uh, I, the main changes which are happening in the effective uh, governance is the uh, independent board of governors. So there will be more of self-governance for higher education institutions and uh, an independent board of governors which will uh, uh, be held accountable but will, will have people who are are uh, very eminent in their fields, uh, just like we have for the, you know, the Indian Institute of Technology and Indian Institute of Management would be happening for other universities as well. So that would make a uh, significant change and all the leadership positions would be offered to people with high academic qualifications and expertise and uh, a lot of leadership programs would also be there for leaders. Like we have the LEAP program in India for uh, people who are identified as uh, uh, leaders for you know, going to the vice chancellor level uh, from deans and uh, uh, other uh, uh, grades of uh, authority. So that is one important change which I just uh, want to emphasize as the independent board of governors. The other change that I want to emphasize is the institutional development plan. So, you know, uh, in terms of the institutions, institutions have to come up with a development plan of their own, which is more strategic and would guide the institutions. And in that, uh, the... Uh, in terms of the faculty, uh, there would be more, uh, you know, of course, there would be more autonomy for faculty in terms of uh, academic uh, autonomy and, uh, you know, for deciding on study programs and methods of teaching, which they do in their classroom. But I think in India, we already have a lot of academic autonomy at the faculty level. It is more about the, uh, you know, what is the uh, uh, accountability for the faculty. So I think in terms of the, uh, I mean, in the classrooms, you know, we don't really have not told what to teach. Uh, but yes, um, the, code, the curriculum is decided by the Board of Studies and it goes through a certain procedure and framework. So I think uh, in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of the faculty, uh, the uh, academic autonomy they have, but it, there would be other uh, things in, term, in terms of their uh, career progression, which uh, Professor Sawman already touched upon the career advancement scheme, but there would be more of the tenure track positions uh, or a tenure track progression where they would be uh, accountable in terms of, uh, you know, what is their peer and student reviews for their performance. So there would be more performance assessment and also better student-teacher ratios because that's something which we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is a significant problem in terms of having large uh, number of students as per the, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, as a uh, ratio of the faculty. So better student-teacher ratios, better teaching, so, you know, the NEP talks about motiva motivated, energized, and capable faculty. So, you know, that is another thing that, the you know, there is a tendency to lose motivation or loss somewhere along the way because uh, so that there would be more accountability and yet more autonomy, uh, you know, what is, uh, you know, for the at the faculty level. And uh, the final thing I'll talk about is about the, uh, uh, the institutional development plan, coming back to the institutional development plan again, that institutions would have to come up with uh, strategic plans to guide themselves 
and uh, significant governance trend in higher education is the widening of institutional autonomy. So there would be, uh, yeah, I'll just take 10 seconds to just to wind up. Uh, so basically, uh, autonomy should be also accompanied by capacity development efforts at the institutional level. So, you know, autonomy to institutions should not be taken as a way to withdraw uh, at, at the, you know, at the, at the uh, governmental level. So that would not happen. There would be uh, autonomy along with capacity development efforts at the uh, institution level and with core funding of the institutions which are maintained. Like I said, you know, which is already there for our uh, Indian Institutes of Technology and the Institutes of Management. But that has to be generalized to the central state themed universities and other universities in India. Thank you, Dr. Vidya. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Garima. I think you really beautifully brought in, you know, these various elements of governance uh, as reflected in the national education policy. And I think what is important for us as Indian academia is, and more so Indian leadership is, we were never used to a strategic plan that was ever created. I mean, we did speak about it in our forums, in our board of go uh, governance, etc. But this is brought in, and I think the other element of autonomy with accountability and capacity building. I think this is a, another very important point that you brought in. And I think people who uh, you know look at challenges uh, of any new education policy definitely look at this uh, one aspect of how do, uh, will this bring in uh, the requisite uh, you know uh, accountability uh, within teachers, within leadership, etc. But I'm now shifting uh, uh, to you know to people from uh, India and Australia, Professor Salman and Will, uh, is um, you know we are looking at uh, uh, you know this whole transformation of higher education, uh, revitalizing uh, higher education, which happened in Australia now is happening in India, and uh, you know if you look at the the whole transformation, it focuses primarily on autonomy, inclusivity, and internationalization. Uh, I think uh, I mean my personal opinion when I speak on various forums is that the NEP is quite a reflection of internationalization of higher education in the sense if you look at the various elements including the four years degree program at one point in time a few years ago the four year undergraduate program was literally castigated by the Ministry of Education but now you have the new education policy that talks about a four year uh, undergraduate program and then you know a more liberal education program at the undergraduate level. So several elements of what the comparative higher education as we discussed in our academic uh, research and forums has been brought in in the new education policy. I would really like you all to speak on the uniqueness and some common challenges, if I may go to uh, Professor Chattopadhyay first, you know, on the NEP with, whereas the focus is on autonomy, inclusivity and internationalization. Do you really see, foresee any anything which is unique or any of the challenges that you foresee? Um, uh, as this, you know, in this reformative space. Yeah, so thank you, thank you. Uh, you see, the Indian higher education, uh, the overall quality uh, is not something that we feel proud of. There are pockets of excellence, both in the public funded and private funded institutions. But if you look at the entire sector, I think uh, we have to strive harder to achieve good quality. So there are three areas of challenges. First of all, the access. Second is the quality. And third is the future, because the national education policy says that we have to raise the gross enrollment ratio from the existing 28, 29% to 50% by 2030. And what is more challenging that the 50% of those 50% should have adequate exposure to vocational education. Now, now when it comes to the quality issue, let me uh, mention very very, very briefly, three major challenges. First challenge is to how to augment the capacities of the competence or improve the competence of the teachers, because that is very, very vital, because that determines our motivation level as well as our research uh, contribution. Now, 1.5 million teachers that we have in uh, Indian higher education system, and the publication as per the Web of Science is only 0 0.2 million, right? So the Par faculty publication record is uh, somewhat that, you know, uh, I, I think we are not doing reasonably well. The second uh, is the public funding. Now, public funding is a big challenge because, you see, the national education policy is going to uh, foster competition, right? I mean, uh, at the national level as well as at the global level. This competition, uh, if it has to be effective, we need the public funding to be augmented so that we ensured a level playing field. Right now we have 
differences in the capacities uh, by the state, uh, which are really faced with fiscal constraint and center. I mean, the budget for the public uh, budget may or may not be enhanced substantially in the future, because we are going to bank more on blended mode to achieve this expansion in the gross enrollment rate. One thing I must tell you regarding IDP, in the national education policy it is mentioned, Godima has explained what IDP is and you have also explained. See, the IDP is also going to be connected with funding at some future point of time. So our plan, our university's plan will get linked to the funding. So how the funding is allocated within the university, right now it is more or less historically determined based on the cost. So to bring in some efficiency, we have to incentivize the system. We have to have some uh, definite criteria for allocation of funding. The third challenge, I will not elaborate on this, is the poor governance. Academic corruption is rampant in the Indian system. I've already mentioned that there are pockets of excellence. I'm not talking about those uh, universities who are doing well, but the overall, the, the, these unethical practices are really very rampant in the university system. This, the, the next challenge would be for India as a whole, education is in the concurrent list, the state and the state. Now, in order to ensure effective implementation of the national education policy, we want some kind of coordination uh, among the state and the center, cutting across the political lines and the consensus. And that is very, very important, right? So uh, let us see what uh, the future is uh, going to be for us. The next challenge is terms of the access. Now, I believe that the numbers that you get in terms of the gender, social category-wise enrollment and rural-urban divide, the numbers do not reveal the complexity of the, of, of the actually the picture because the, there are very serious intersectionalities on the gender, caste, and region, and they're really deeply embedded into the system. Now, when you are talking about digital divide, blended mode, expansion of the system based on online education and vocationalization, we, we have to be a little more concerned about the existing reality. Those challenges have to be tackled in order to ensure effective implementation of the uh, NEP. Thank you. Let me stop here. Yes, uh, Professor Samin, you've really brought in excellent, uh, you know, aspects or rather I would say challenges, uh, you know, in the Indian higher education system and, uh, you know, all of us experience what you uh, said just now. The funding is very, very critical, I think, for Indian institutions. And now, of course, the, you link research also to funding and with the hope of the National Research Foundation coming in uh, to support re research across uh, the higher education institutions, whether private or public funded, I think that may see a little bit of change uh, to the positive because research is expensive. And therefore you see a lot of Indian academia, in fact, collaborating with foreign partners uh, to bring in some funding from uh, their foreign counterparts. So we see that happening more now. Uh, the second aspect, again, which is very critical in India is access and inclusivity. You know, how does every child, every student, no matter which area, which region, which caste, creed they, they come from, uh, gets access to good quality education. And they're again leading uh, to the gross enrollment ratio, which is an ambitious ratio. We want to reach the GER of 50. Uh, so yes, there are challenges in the Indian higher education system. And I think as, uh, as all of us in the governance uh, of universities, we are trying to mitigate these. Uh, and ensuring that you know we do our best within the given framework of the regulatory mechanism. Coming to the Australian higher education system, we see that there are a lot of reforms that take place. Can you, uh, Willem, highlight a few challenges that you face, maybe some uniqueness of these reforms? Yeah, and thanks very much. Um, as many people know, there's a national conversation in Australia about higher education reform at the moment. Um, it's called uh, to the uh, Universities Accord process. Uh, so the government has initiated uh, an inquiry which is dealing uh, with uh, a lot of these issues and that uh, inquiry will report at the end of the year. But when we think about uh, reform in Australian higher education, a lot of the challenges, uh, and despite the you know obvious differences in scale between Indian and Australian higher education, we can see quite a few commonalities. And um, while uh, I can't cover all the issues, I just thought we might highlight a couple, especially where there's um, um, some real common challenges uh, for both, both systems in both countries. Uh, and particularly thinking about uh, the question of governance and system governance. 
Um, you know, Australia, uh, Australian universities, as Chris has pointed out, you know, are in many ways quite autonomous and they've been very uh, autonomous. So they have a high degree of autonomy in how they uh, organise themselves uh, and, you know, use their resources. They've been very activist, obviously, in the international market and they've gone out there and we've um, talked about that. And I'll mention in a moment some of the, the challenges that that presents. And in terms of uh, some of the real common uh, issues that both countries face, you know, that question of how to um, increase inclusivity uh, and scale up uh, when, uh, you know, Australia, uh, there's a, a real, there is quite a high proportion of, you know, um, students who attend. We've got a very high GER, as you noted. Uh, but nonetheless, um, we, uh, there's aspirations to grow that. And the question is, what sort of supports and what sort of institutional forms do we need to be able to get, um, you know, different students in, especially those that have faced uh, all sorts of different disadvantage. Um, and this is this is where the, the autonomy that many Australian or all Australian universities enjoy really um, uh, can cause a, a potential challenge in terms of system planning. And that's really one of the challenges that the government uh, and others are thinking about. Uh, you know, with universities that are in many ways competing, there's you know competition uh, uh, for students, there's competition for uh, research funding. Um, you know, what levers and mechanisms. Um, can be brought into play to better coordinate, uh, especially in terms of things like, you know, provision in different parts of the country uh, where uh, there isn't uh, access for a higher education for, for many students, um, uh, as well as thinking about those other sort of supports that need to come into play. Um, you know, while there's a, no a number of issues around uh, workforce and, you know, sort of future workforce, there's a number of issues around how we do um, funding for research. The one thing that I'd really highlight that I think is um, key uh, challenge for the Australian system and maybe where it does differ from um, a lot of the challenge for our Indian higher education in terms of the reform process with the NEP is the, the point Chris made before about uh, international student uh, market and the reliance that many universities have on high uh, levels of income from international student fees. Um, this is one thing that does set uh, Australian higher education apart from many systems in the world is that, you know, many of our universities and in particular our very large research institutions are highly reliant on those international student fees to fund, um, you know, almost the majority of their research effort. Uh, so the question then um, comes for you know government and others thinking about reform you know in uh if we want to scale up the system and bring other people in uh, how can resources be moved around um you know what other public investment uh, does there need to be uh, to ensure that all institutions are able to deliver that and you know lastly and i'll end on this note is to say that you know because uh the our large research uh, universities are so reliant on international student dollars they can put them in a very precarious position in terms of our research output um you know uh and what's the sort of path forward in terms of thinking about uh you know what options we have to make sure that there's more public investment but i'll leave it there thank you thank you Vin. uh it's nice to see actually or hear rather that you know the challenges are almost similar in two different regions across the world uh you know while sitting here and discussing our own challenges with someone else you know on, on the other side uh, who faces the same challenges, very surprising. But I think what, what we need to learn from, uh, from Australia as Indian academic uh, or our, as university leaders is, uh, or I would say the government, which has to definitely learn about how you all look at international students, uh, you know, who bring in funding for your research and, you know, other areas, uh, which we never look at in India. You know, in India, whenever we look at even international students, it's about diversity, it's about inclusion. You know, we look at students coming from the Afro-Asian background or typically from Africa who we look at providing them with better education than that that they would get in their home country. So it's a very different, uh, you know, way of how we look at international students. We never look at the commercial angle of, you know, because they, the students who come to India, honestly, are the ones who come from developing countries or who can't afford education in the West. And therefore, they come here and seek of quality education. So the context is a little different when it comes to attracting foreign students. Uh, I'm glad we raised uh, these challenges. But coming back to Garima first and then Chris, uh, we've looked at these challenges uh, 
Can we discuss some of the opportunities that exist more specifically for uh, future research collaboration between India and Australia? Because right here during the discussions, there's several topics that have come up. So Garima, would you like to go first? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vidya. Uh, so uh, I think I'll pick up from where Soman uh, talked about the, uh, you know, uh, education being on the concurrent list. And, you know, we have a very diverse system in terms of central universities, state universities, deemed universities, private universities. So, and, uh, you know, most of the enrollment actually is in the state universities and in the affiliated colleges, because we have a large affiliating college system, which is set to change with the NEP. But I think in terms of future research collaboration, it would be very interesting to see the differences in faculty autonomy and how we negotiate that in the context of institutional autonomy and accountability. So that's why I mentioned about the differences between the different uh, kinds of institutions we have, because it's not a homogeneous structure, it's a very heterogeneous structure. And you know, it's very diverse. Uh, so uh, we have different kinds of institutions and in, in order to navigate the faculty autonomy, we have to see that when institutions are getting autonomy in the context of graded autonomy, is it concentrated in the you know, offices of vice chancellors and deans, or is it actually filtering down to the faculty level? So, you know, is it that faculty, there is more participation in terms of the collegial model of governance rather than the bureaucratic, or now, in fact, the managerial model of governance, where we have uh, a more of the, you know, the managerial uh, kind of uh, uh, factors which are coming in. So I think that there is a, a lot of potential for future research collaboration between India and Australia. It was very interesting to hear what Christopher and Gwyn had to say also uh, about the Australian system, because there are similarities and yet there are differences. So I think that, you know, to see that how uh, when institutions get autonomy in terms of grade one or grade two or and, and, and so on, how does it actually come down to the faculty level? You know, what does, uh, uh, does it filter down to the faculty? Do they have more of academic autonomy? And, uh, uh, you know, and how does it navigate for the uh, financial autonomy aspects? So I think in that respect, uh, there, this would be a very key area of uh, future research collaboration because one of the things that is happening in India with the NEP is that, you know, it's it's at the central level, it's fine, but if some, some states have chosen to take their own path. Uh, so that that's something which we have to also take into account that, you know, it's, it's not uh, necessarily... Uh, the same story across different states in India. And uh, because of the kind of structure we have, uh, different states are, are, are having different kinds of, uh, you know, national, uh, uh, different kind of state policies with respect. And that affects the state universities because the state universities are located in different states. Uh, so while the central universities are governed by the Central Act, uh, the state universities are uh, have different layers of funding. So that is uh, going to affect that. So I think that uh, this would be a very important area of research collaboration, and uh, it would be very interesting to see what the Australian universities and what is the diversity and what is the structure they have and how the uh, autonomy that they have, does it filter down to the faculty level? If, you know, do the, do the faculty have uh, freedom to decide what courses they teach, what uh, uh, different kinds of financial autonomy, if you want to go for a conference, if you want to go for, uh, you know, so you, you have some significant uh, autonomy in that respect. So I think that would be very interesting to have this kind of uh, area of future research uh, collaboration. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, uh, Professor Garima, I think this is a wonderful topic. Uh, I think faculty across uh, our institutions uh, will be happy if, you know, uh, uh, something new comes up and we as Indian institutions get to learn from Australia. I think it's very critical when you talk about institutional uh, autonomy and accountability. Uh, how do you bring in that autonomy to faculty? And then how do you bring in the accountability to faculty as well? Uh, we see now, you know, when um, when we govern a university with the focus on rankings, accreditation, and the very high focus on research output, uh, there are some excellent teachers who probably are not as interested in research, but university governance forces them to publish. And then, you know, the dichotomy of whether you're really giving that academic autonomy to say that, I'm an excellent teacher and I would love to just go and teach in class, but I just don't want to publish or I just want to minimally publish and not really as per your expectations. Now, this kind of autonomy, but then on the other side, you have the accountability from the, the ranking agencies and the accreditation agencies and you know your benchmarking is decided by what grade you are and your category one status to give you that institutional autonomy also depends on where you're ranked and how you're uh, accredited. Uh, so, you know, it's a really complex issue. What exactly do you mean by faculty autonomy also needs to be defined. 
Uh, and I think it it's also about governance and finance and funding because, uh, you know, especially in self-finance institutions, uh, you know, how do you really give that kind of funding to the faculty to say and that, you know, you can use these funds for research, you can use these funds to attend conferences and not really come back to the vice chancellor to ask for permissions. You have this fund with you, uh, you know, uh, every year and you can just spend it the way you want. But then again, what is the accountability? What do you, how do you judge and measure that? So I think it's an excellent topic. Uh, so would you like to come in and share your views on uh, any research topic of interest? Sure. And uh, look, this is a topic that we haven't really spoken much about today, but uh, there's a, there's a, a regu the, the interface between universities and regulated professions is, is a, a really uh, an emergent area, which I think particularly for the Australia-India relationship is going to be key in the next few years. Um, and so the, this impacts on curriculum development within institutions, on the accreditation of curriculum by accreditation bodies in each profession, uh, and the licensing of our graduates in order to practice. And so regulated professions, we mean all those where you need a kind of special license in order to practice, so engineering, teaching, nursing, et cetera, a growing proportion of the population work in regulated professions in all societies. And so, um, and within each country, the, there's been a development over time of these connections between the education systems and the licensing systems. They don't speak to each other very well across borders. And so it limits the mobility of professionals and qualifications significantly. Now, this is a, um, an issue which Australia has been doing a lot of work on in, in harmonising uh, these processes across uh, countries, in part because we have a long history of immigration. Uh, and we we recruit uh, through the immigration program lots of skilled workers, particularly in regulated professions. And so the Australian system is adept at kind of recognising foreign qualifications in all sorts of ways. Um, and so at the moment, there's um, uh, we have a lot of international students, uh, including from India, who have post-study work rights in Australia, who get professional accreditation and licences and can practice as nurses, for example, in Australia, but then whose nursing qualifications are not necessarily going to be recognised in India very easily. There's a very convoluted process. Um, and uh, so we have a bilateral agreement between Australia and India now for recognition of academic qualifications, which is fantastic. It came into effect this year. Uh, and there's, a, there's negotiations underway on a broader economic agreement between Australia and India. That will have a chapter on recognition of professional qualifications within that agreement. Uh, and so there will be pressure from governments on both sides for our professional bodies to recognise each other. That will involve universities um, interfacing with accreditation bodies and so on. Um, and so, for example, in nursing, there's a, a bilateral agreement between Singapore and India on recognition of nursing graduates. Uh, which includes, I think, seven Indian universities programs are recognised in India. Oh, sorry, in um, in Singapore, and a, a number of Singaporean programs recognised in India. Now that kind of sets the model for how these agreements are likely to happen. But it's going to that sort of uh, um, reciprocal recognition of qualifications is going to have a big impact on does demand for higher education in India the students who are seeking to be able to work abroad and but so who are seeking Indian qualifications which are recognised internationally, um, as well as for Indian students in Australia who want their qualifications recognised back home, et cetera. Um, so I think there's a, there's, it's, a, it's an area of interest of institution, of both governments, uh, and um, there's quite a bit of work that's happened on this side so far that I think we can build on and... Um, yeah, it's a little bit tangential to the others, but there's real um, opportunities for improving alignment between the education, our, our universities and the professional bodies and the and the sectors that we produce graduates for. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chris. Again, a very important topic, more so with the national education policy in India, focusing on internationalization and with the regulation from the University Grants Commission facilitating the dual degrees and the joint degrees, I think aligning curriculum is something that we definitely need to kind of do research on and come to some terms because even though, uh, you know, we're, we've been working with 
to give an example of our university, we've been working with another Australian university for the last 20 years in student mobility, faculty exchange. But when it came to dual degrees, you know, I think they're breaking their heads and still haven't come to a conclusion of aligning the curriculum when the degrees are the same. Uh, but still, you know, so I know how difficult it is. And we really, that's some new area of research. And more specifically, again, being a medical doctor and being in the, uh, as a healthcare professional practicing earlier, of course, I don't practice anymore. But yes, what you said is very right. The regulated professions, it's pretty difficult, whether it's law, whether it's medicine or nursing. So I think that's another new area that we can, but with the agreements between India and Australia, uh, we we do see uh, you know this happening very soon. But uh, nevertheless, I think a, a good area for research uh, so uh, I think I will end the question answer session here. But what we have also planned for you all is to react to each other, uh, you know, like an interpanel discussion that we can do uh, between, uh, you know, the four of you. If, uh, if you have any question from either side, and it not necessarily means that uh, the Australia Australian side has to ask India and vice versa, you could ask to each other as well. So can we spend a few minutes? on this i mean are there any any reactions any questions to what uh, your fellow panelists have said professor chatopadhyay you want to go first yeah yeah, yeah thank you uh, you know i uh, personally feel that you know when we are embracing the global order because there is a good deal of uh, thrust on internationalization uh, there is an asymmetry in the in the relationship you know the number of students that we received from the other countries, from the foreign countries, would be barely 49, 50,000. Whereas we are sending you know, uh, six, to eight, six to seven million students are studying abroad. Now, when uh, I was listening to the proposal made by uh, William, uh, the research collaboration should be also a part of this. I mean, you know, how uh, the basic idea is to improve the and the demand for skill is uh, rapidly changing, right? And so the credit transfer and consolidation of academic equivalences and all, all these factors are extremely important uh, for this India, Australia, uh, this kind of collaboration. So this is uh, an important topic. Uh, but uh, my, uh, I was a bit interested to know from my uh, colleagues, Christopher and Julian about this uh, faculty uh, regulation, I don't know whether we have enough time for you to reflect on uh, the incentivization that you have, whether your pay scale is incentivized, and the public private divide, and to what extent this divide is very deep or it is blood. I mean, these are my issues. That's all. I mean, given the time yeah. constraint, I understand whether. No, that's a good discussion. question. I think it will be good for the audience also to hear their responses. So, Chris, would you like to go first and then Will? Sure, but maybe Gwil, you would have talked more about the the, the 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 impact on academic motivations and the workforce issues. I think at that level is really interesting, both in in terms of academic uh, autonomy, but the the way that the system and the institutions create drivers for behaviour within institutions. So it's a really important point. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and yeah, happy to say something on this. I mean, Australia is often held up as an early adopter of new public management reforms. Um, particularly uh, for higher education. Uh, and I think uh, there's clearly a lot of truth to that in terms of you know, how universities are managed and governed. Um, Australian uh, governments have largely um, steered uh, universities through financial incentive um, for many years. And that's where that sort of high formal level of institutional autonomy comes from. Um, but the, 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 well, and many people would argue the downside of that has been that it has put uh, institutional managers, leaders, vice chancellors in quite a difficult position often in terms of how they um, manage their operations. But importantly, to the point that Chris is getting at, um, you know, what it means in terms of how staff are managed and the incentives and pressures that are put upon staff. Uh, so, you know, leading towards uh, all sorts of mechanisms for managing performance, um, uh, there's a, uh, in terms of the way that people are employed, you know, Australia has a very high level of uh, 
you know, uh, casual short-term contract employment for academics, um, which puts a lot of, um, while they might have a lot of sort of formal autonomy in what they do and indeed what they teach, um, practically many people argue that there's significant constraints um, just because of the how tenuous their jobs can be, you know, the pressures to, you know, fund positions and the like. Uh, and that in, in terms of the uh, joint research um, uh, area. This is something that I think there's a real fertile ground for uh, India and Australia to learn from each other, um, partly because Australia is so much further down the path in terms of the sort of new public management reforms and what they've meant uh, for the way that universities are governed. Uh, but also the scale of India means that they're facing, you know, challenges that Australia hasn't uh, in thinking about what uh, institutional autonomy means for different types of uh, universities. Yes, uh, th thank you for the response. Garima, would you like to come in? Uh, any any question on any of the, not just responding to this one, but any anything else that you would like to comment on? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll just comment on what uh, Dr. Vidya had said earlier about the teaching and research part in India. So, you know, it, I think uh, William was touching on that in terms of the new public management reforms that are taking, you know, that have already taken place. And now in India also, you know, we are having more and more of accountability. So, you know, how does this uh, teaching and research, uh, you know, this uh, kind of balance out in terms of faculty uh, incentivization? And, you know, so because uh, I, I think for research, there is, of course, the, you know, the publications and the indexes and H index and others. But, you know, for the teaching, I mean, so that, it, you know, they, there is a balance of the two. So that is something that I just wanted to ask both uh, William and Christopher. Well, and, yes, and yes. maybe I can take that. Yeah, so... Um, Look on a on a practical level for, for academic staff. There's a an expectation that they're pretty much every well most academics in Australia are engaged in research as well as teaching and and uh, other engagement service activities. Um, and so there's that expectation. I guess that's um, uh, so there's time allocated to different degrees for different staff. Um, but then that's really uh, kind of assessed through a promotions framework. So in order to progress from lecturer to senior lecturer to associate professor, uh, there's a lot of, of scrutiny over achievement in, in both those domains. I mean, historically, the critique has been that research is more privileged in terms of promotions than teaching, who are leading academics to not put as much energy into their teaching practice as into, into research. Uh, I think that's shifting uh, quite significantly. Um, and there's all sorts of metrics in the system about you know, student evaluations of every subject, uh, research metrics and so on that, um, that academics are very aware of, all of those things. Um, yeah, so the, those, those um, I think they work pretty well. And look, there is academics in Australia at the moment do feel quite a degree of pressure uh, on both those things to get consistently higher student evaluations and to be bringing in research income and to be publishing. And uh, there's there's a sense of workload pressures because those drivers are fairly, con you know, front of mind for academic staff. Yeah. So, I don't know, Will, if you want to add sorry. One thing I did want to add, and this is a point um, I, I touched on before, was just uh, in terms of the sort of employment contract for many staff, which really um, accentuates and amplifies some of the challenges that Chris talks about in terms of the way that staff are managed. Um, you know, on a headcount basis, you know, over over half of academic staff are on either short term or casual contracts at any one time in Australia, uh, so they just don't have. Um, the kind of permanency um, to uh, have time for research, uh, as well as, you know, the sort of autonomy individually, um, potentially be able to push back or, you know, determine their own uh, work for w academic path. Yeah, I think I just, uh, I mean, if I would like to also react to what you all have said, uh, as Dariva and Chris, you all very rightly said, I think there's a lot of pressure on Indian academia as well now. Uh, you know, earlier, I think they were, they had the autonomy to not publish and not do research and just to be excellent teachers teaching in class. So finally, Indian institutions, and I mean, world over, but more specifically in India, because of the large population, the large young student and aspirational students that we have, uh, employment generation is very, very critical. And I think uh, when it comes to that is the focus on teaching is again, very critical. So you have good teachers to teach in classrooms and obviously your employment question arises because you gain that knowledge, but now, with the focus on research because of rankings and accreditation where Indian institutions uh, are also aspiring to be in the best in the world, uh, that's when this whole 
you know, focus on research and now the pressure on faculty has come in. And I, I mean, I face it at my university and I'm sure everybody faces in their universities where, you know, you feel so sad that, you know, they're really good teachers who just would just love to be in the class um, and teach and they just wouldn't want to do research. But then what do you do? Because faculty publication ratio is critical. Professor Salman just mentioned about it. How poor are we as a country? And imagine how poor we could be as a university as well. And that's where you are judged, unfortunately, you know. Uh, so, so I think that this pressure is there. But I think the question that uh, Professor Chattopadhyay asked was, how do you, re and even Garima asked was, how do you, do you incentivize? I mean, is there an incentive for teachers doing excellent research, you know, um, with high citations and so on? So is there anything like that other than the funding of the research that the universities may be doing? Uh, if I can jump in there, there's not any kind of financial incentive. So if if you publish a lot or have a high degree of PhD completions or so on, there's no kind of immediate financial reward to the academics. Uh, but it, it's really the promotions framework and appointments. So if you if you're not uh, doing well on those metrics, it's very difficult to get promoted. It's very difficult to move institutions. Uh, and if you are, then that makes you, you know, you get promoted uh, more rapidly and you can apply for jobs elsewhere and often moving up and sideways. And so it's really that mobility up and, and out through the system that's enhanced through performance measures. Um, so there is, a, I guess, a financial kind of reward there or, and status reward in terms of moving up to higher academic levels. That's really the driver. Uh, I think that to come back to uh, what needs to support the academic autonomy is that many academics feel a bit lost in, you know, early career academics. Uh, if they don't have any support and advice and mentoring for how to do research, you know, how to develop their career, how to develop their teaching. And, if, you know, the institution, in some cases, they get the feeling, well, yes, I, I'm told I need to be doing high quality research and teaching, but I'm not actually given the tools and the support to improve my teaching and research. Um, and so that, that differs a lot from department to department, institution to institution, the extent to which individuals are able to access that kind of mentoring support. Um, and I think that's something that's really required in order to, uh, I mean, the motivation of academics on, on the one side is one thing, but then support for them to, to realise that uh, their aspirations. Um, I think the, the better is important also. So the better the institutions can provide targeted support to those academics to help them develop, that's, that makes a big difference also. Uh, great. Uh, I think one last uh, reaction or question or comment from my side is that we have spoken about research and incentivization or not, and you know how the pressure on faculty, you know, uh, is there. Uh, but does uh, Australian universities do they have some, uh, specific teaching learning uh, resource centers to help faculty? You know, especially the new faculty members who join fresh out of the PhDs. Uh, is there any support on teaching learning process that uh, that is given? Because we don't see that as many uh, as much in most Indian universities. So you uh, directly jump into a class after your PhD, and then you know some students are well versed, uh, and sometimes it just uh, it's it's just very uh, it's a really an anxious moment for the teacher. So is there any kind of support that Australian universities do provide? Like the teachers. I think uh, Professor Chattopadhyay and Garima, would you like to comment on what I, I, I hope I'm clear on what I'm saying? You know, most Indian universities wouldn't have, a, you know, they go for their faculty development programs much later. So there's nothing like an induction done through uh, or a support that is given through teaching learning resource centers that you see in most American universities or Australian universities. I think so, uh, Dr. Vidya, that's absolutely right. I think there needs to be more uh, of, you know, faculty development programs. We have, we have them at the UGC HRDC centers, but you know, they're few and far between. And I think, uh, you know, there needs to be this, uh, what Christopher said about the mentoring. Uh, I think that is not just for the institution, but even for individuals. I mean, you know, this kind of mentoring of uh, junior or faculty who just come in by senior faculty uh, uh, in whatever way, you know, the, the system works out would be, you know, very effective. And there is a funded Madan Mohan Malviya mission for teachers and teaching and, uh, you know, which now the government is launching also a mission uh, renewed uh, mission where they are talking about the uh, you know having sessions for uh, about uh, I think uh, you know 15 lakh teachers and uh, having resource centers and 
uh, natural resource centers for teaching and learning. So we are we are making uh, I think uh, small steps, but uh, you know we have a long way to go. Absolutely. Uh, any other comments? I might just say on that there are uh, centers like the one that me and Chris are in, uh, attached to that provide teacher um, higher education teacher training uh, and many universities have similar programs but there is a national conversation in Australia at the moment about how to potentially make that more consistent you know some people have suggested that it might be a requirement um, so we face a similar challenge uh, India. You know, I mean, uh, just, uh, I mean, just, just, just yes. Mark, I mean, uh, Bidda, uh, I mean, Professor Bidda, what you mentioned is actually very appropriate. We do have faculty induction program, but we don't focus much on pedagogy, how to teach, communicate, and to improve the teaching learning outcome. Because we have done our PhD and we are supposed to have expertise in the respective areas of knowledge and we are supposed to do well. All we are supposed to do, but at the end of it, all of us don't do well. Right? I mean, I'm still evolving as a teacher. Every class is a challenge for me. So yes, I think the pedagogy part is not adequately emphasized upon in a training program. So maybe this this is one more new area for research uh, between the two uh, countries. You know, we could take this up as a third area of research, uh, joint research between India and Australia. So I think it's 12.31 now. We've crossed one minute beyond our time. There are a lot of questions in the chat box, but I think many of them are similar to what we have discussed. And I'm sure the audience has got answers to these questions. So thank you very much. Uh, I think it was an excellent uh, discussion and an excellent panel. Uh, I've been moderating a lot of sessions, but this one, I must say, was really very intense. And a lot of new things, especially a lot of joint research will come out of this, which I uh, am really happy about. Uh, so thank you, audience, for joining this wonderful uh, panel on, uh, you know, on governance and funding of higher education institutions. Let me also tell you that this... Uh, this forum was delivered in partnership with the community of uh, associate deans, research and education, Melbourne uh, Graduate School of Education, Zakir Hussain Center for Educational Studies, National Institute of Education Planning and Administration, Symbiosis International University, and supported by the Australian Government Department of Education. Uh, today's session, of course, will be uh, recorded and uh, has been recorded, and you will uh, see this recording on the link that has been provided on the chat box. We will have some more forums like these coming up. Uh, you will, uh, of course, once you register, you will get uh, information about the same. And I'm, I'm glad that all of you have joined. And thank you once again, uh, wonderful panelists. And we'll stay in touch. And I'm sure a lot of new research, joint research will come out uh, between India and Australia. Thank you.